Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Isabel. I am the teen librarian at the Altadena Library. And today I am so excited to present the first video in a new series of interviews that we're doing called Strange Avenues. Strange Avenues is a video series that is, or an interview series that is all about introducing y'all, the teens of Altadena and beyond, to new or interesting careers that you might never have thought of. So it's about exploring all of those strange avenues that you maybe could be super fruitful. We're gonna go down all the strange avenues. We're gonna find out what's what's down there. They're fun and safe avenues. They're not uh, creepy and dark. Um, so today I am super excited to introduce you to a fabulous person and a cool friend of mine. Um, her name is Krista. Krista is a planetarium educator at Liberty Science Center, where she presents live astronomy programs and creates laser shows. Amazing. Um, Krista holds a bachelor's degree in earth, space, science, and secondary education, a master's of education degree, and is currently pursuing her PhD. She loves movies, traveling, playing the drums, and cooking. And she lives in New Jersey with her husband, her cat, and her telescope. Please give a warm welcome to Kristen Yens. Yay! Oh yeah! <laughs> Krista, Hello. thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited. Hey. So um, I have to like embarrass both of us a little bit by saying that we have met before um, because Krista used to be the drummer <laughs> in a very cool um, indie indie band. Sure. Sure, yeah. And I knew some people in this band and I went to probably one of your shows or something like that. And I was like, girl drummer, need to know her. Um, and then we probably hung out and we were talking and then you moved away from, you moved to PA, right? Pennsylvania? Yes. And we're like, I have to go get my master's degree in science education. And I was like, this is the coolest person I've ever met. Why does she have to leave? Um, but I'm really glad that we get to work professionally together now. Um, beyond we're, we're so, so adult now. Oh my God. I know. Right. <laughs> yeah. So I have some questions for you about your job and about what you do and all sorts of stuff. Um, and then I understand that you have some cool treats for us as well. I do. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so my first question is tell us about your first experience or your first memory of astronomy like what was the thing that got you hooked or something or interested yeah so people have asked me that before and I have never really been able to pinpoint an answer I think it's something that I just always liked but I never realized that I could study and I remember when I was applying to college and I knew I wanted to be a teacher but I wasn't sure what I wanted to teach and as I was looking at the majors that existed, I saw earth and space science. And I was like, that's a, I can do that? That's a thing? <laughs> and I realized that, wow, like, yeah, I've always loved space and I've always loved outside and nature. And mm -hmm. I was like, this is perfect. And it, and it worked out. Um, I do remember though, I had been to the planetarium. It was part of our school field trips. And ironically, I don't remember seeing anything about the night sky but I remember the presenter lit a piece of metal on fire and it burned super bright to show how bright a star looks. And, and I remember that and <laughs> here I am now. So yeah, there you go. Well, that was my other question was like, mm. yeah. So you said that you got your bachelor's in like earth and space science. Um, did you know, so then you must like, when you were in high school, you still, did you know that you were interested in STEM fields or were you always like doing that in school prior to college? So I actually skipped over earth science in high school <laughs> <laughs> and I took biology first and then I took other classes and it's, it's very funny. And I think that's actually super encouraging that I didn't quite know what I wanted to do when I was in high school. I actually skipped over the course that I ended up uh, <laughs> being a professional in. So it's never really too late and it's okay if you're not sure what you want to do yet. Um, but when I was in college, I actually got the chance to um, 
do some research. So we had an inflatable planetarium at my college, which looks like a giant bouncy castle, if you've never seen them, um, or, or like a big igloo that you crawl inside and then we can show you the night sky. So I actually volunteered to help out and we would take that to schools and give shows. And ever since then, I was like, I love these planetarium things. They're amazing. And I've just gotten involved in every way that I could since then. That's really cool. Yeah, I mean, I like the idea that we've talked about this before with um, when it comes to like finding your passion or your career, like sometimes it really just is an accident that you end up mm -hmm. in something that you're like, oh, that is exactly what I was looking for. Um, and I think that can be encouraging because it means you don't have to like have your whole life planned out. Like mm -hmm. sometimes you're just like, you'll know in your gut when you're doing the right thing. It sounds mm -hmm. like with you too, like, I'm like, oh, this is maybe what I want to do. I didn't know that I could do this. Yep. Yeah, um, exactly. That's really cool. Did you ever go to the library when you were uh, a teenager? All the time. <laughs> and I, st I still do. <laughs> what are your memories of the library? What was it like? Was the library like? It was, so I don't know if anyone's read Matilda, if anyone watching has read that. That was one of my favorite books. And um, I, I mean, I had a great mom who also loved reading. And so I had a great role model and she would take us, my brother and I to the library. And I would literally go to read Garfield comics at sometimes. I used to was like, check out Garfield comics. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember the, the reading lists and the summer challenges and, and the, the best thing about the library to me was it had such a variety that no matter what mood you were in, there was a book that kind of spoke to it. So if you felt like a mystery or you felt like Garfield, you know, it, there was always something there. And I always just loved the atmosphere too. I mean, it was kind of like a place you could go hide almost. <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> library is so much fun. Um, so, okay. So talk me through a sort of like your progression. So you said that like you started at college and you were like, oh, I can do earth science. Um, is that correct? Earth science? Yep. Okay. Um, and you started volunteering with the planetarium, like how, how, and from there, like, what was your next step? You're like, oh, I love working in this planet. I love doing this planetarium stuff when you graduated from college did you know at that point then that you wanted to like pursue planetariums as opposed to like other kinds of earth science I don't really know what the field is like so there's I mean my job path has been all over the place and I <laughs> and honestly um part of what I do now is I do research in the education field so I've talked to a lot of planetarium people and with us specifically almost no one has gone to school to work in a planetarium except for me. I'm the only, oh, really? <laughs> like one of the only people I know that realized when I went back to graduate school, I was like, I really want to, to get into a planetarium and kind of started to focus on informal education. So education outside of classrooms, different museums and stuff like that. Um, but I've met so many people who have come from art backgrounds, from technology backgrounds, people who just have liked astronomy and they started volunteering and eventually now they work in one. Um, but to answer your original <laughs> question, after I graduated college, I had my first dream of teaching in a school. So that's actually what I did right after I taught in Baltimore City for two years um, and I taught biology because sometimes that's what happens, even though that's not <laughs> my, my major is sometimes, you know. Um, so after I did that for a few years, I realized, wow, I really miss planetariums and I'm gonna try to go back to, to grad school and maybe help get some experience to get me into a planetarium. So I did that for a few years. And uh, while I was at actually both schools, uh, both my undergrad and my grad school had a planetarium in it. So I volunteered, I volunteered with them, you know, I was like, this is a cool thing. How do I get involved as an astronomy club? You know, so I just kind of put myself in those places and got the experience. Um, and then after I was at grad school, I actually taught on a mobile laboratory that drove around and did uh, science labs for high school students. I did that for a couple of years. And then, <laughs> and then now I'm up teaching in the planetarium that I actually had my sights on 
for a while. So I kind of, yeah, so I kind of have my, my dream job. It's the biggest planetarium in the Western hemisphere of earth. So Are you serious? Yep. So <laughs> it was a big, a uh, big step. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I've, I've been all over the place, but I've always kept, I, I knew what I wanted to do. So mm -hmm. even when I wasn't working in a planetarium, I still watched documentaries. I still tried to volunteer with you know, there's science centers all over. I mean, there's yeah. one in, there's a great Griffith Observatory that, you know, if you haven't been to visit, you should, because it's really <laughs> awesome. Um, you know, so I just, yeah, just kind of kept it in my world. Gotcha. And that's interesting what you said that a lot of, some of your coworkers don't have like, uh, like an astronomy background mm -hmm. or anything like that. Um, that's really interesting that they kind of come from all over. Mm -hmm. So yeah. talk us through like what is a day in the life of a director like or like what are the kind of projects that you work on what does it look like So uh, this answer would probably be different for a lot um depending on who you're talking to and and where they work um but for me specifically so a typical day um especially before covid um yes. is <laughs> <That's a follow -up>. <laughs> <laughs> So the, the planetarium I work at is part of a science center. Mm -hmm. um, so we have um, schools that would come in for field trips. We would have college students come in. Um, we'd have senior citizens come in on trips. Um, and then we just have the general public. So a family would, will come to visit the science center and they'll come to the planetarium. Um, so there's a mixture of things that um, I do each day. I can give a show completely live. So I can show on this big planetarium dome up above, we talk about black holes and what you can see in the night sky tonight. And I'll talk to you for 45 minutes and <laughs> about whatever you want, want to learn about. Um, but we do also show movies and um, like Isabel said in the beginning, uh, I'm actually in charge of the laser show program now. So I make laser shows that we uh, play. Yeah, it's really fun. <laughs> so I, I've done that. Um, it's, it's basically just talking, talking a lot mm -hmm. to large groups of people. We can fit almost 400 people in our planetarium. Oh my gosh. So, yeah. <laughs> so I, I used to be really shy. <laughs> and uh not confident not talking anymore. and <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah I feel like similarly I've never been someone who's like super outgoing but like certain jobs you have to turn it on um and entertain people mm -hmm. um that's crazy I'm trying to think when the last time I was in a planetarium probably at the Maryland Science Center they, <laughs> they do yeah okay okay well, yep. <laughs> like, what goes into um what's the kind of like research or what goes into planning your shows yeah so we actually are doing research all the time because anytime something changes which is constantly in astronomy anytime something changes we want to share it with everyone so if something big happens we um study up on ourselves we have um connections right if we know someone who works with nasa um then we can talk with them and um mm -hmm. We do a lot of online research. We actually create, um, there's one of my coworkers works a lot with computers. So he creates these 3D models of the different rockets that go out into space so we can show it on the planetarium. So there's a lot of creativity that goes into it. And we have to figure out a way to make it interesting instead of just saying this, the rocket is this big and it goes this fast and, but you know, we want to make it fun and cause it's cool. So. <laughs> That's really neat. What is your, well, so how have things changed um, in, in COVID time? <laughs> so since COVID, so the Science Center was actually closed for a while and we would do stuff like this. So mm -hmm. we will give shows to schools. They'll kind of all log on to Zoom or whatever platform. And we have planetarium software and we can basically give us a, a show just on a computer screen. So it's not quite the same as being in the big space, you know, and kind of with the sky all around you, but we can still talk about it and, and show you fun stuff. So it's been a lot of virtual shows. Yeah, yeah. What is your favorite part of your job? Oh, geez. Every, I mean, everything. Yeah. <laughs> the fact that it changes so much is really good for me because I, I like change. I don't like doing the same thing over and over and over again. 
So having different people that I see all the time, um, I meet kids who come in and they know more than I do. And it's amazing. <laughs> you know, we have a, a kid who comes in. Every, <laughs> we have a kid who comes in every year and he dresses up as a different planet for Halloween every year. So <laughs> it's yeah, there's a, there's amazing people that we meet. And I love that. And yeah, just just being able to talk about a thing that I love mm -hmm. and share it and try to get show people that this is this is cool and it's OK to like it. It's OK to be interested, <laughs> <laughs> you know yeah can you say this um maybe you can't answer this question but do you have like a least favorite part of your job um i don't know because if any i mean it's it, part of what we do is customer service right so we get people that can come and they might not be super happy with what they see or you know they might not realize what a planetarium is mm -hmm. but even so it's i still get a chance to share with them and even if it's I'm having a bad, super stressful day, that one kid who says thank you on the way out, it just makes everything super worth it. So just like any job, there's you know stress and ups and downs, but I think because I love what I do, the positives outweigh the negatives so much more. Okay, that's great. That's a good answer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Um, what is maybe a misconception about your field or about like STEM or, or science or astronomy? Like, do you encounter any common misconceptions? Yeah, I would say the biggest thing is that it's hard and confusing and not even <laughs> worth talking about. You know, if, if you say astronomy to someone, they might immediately think of these quantum mechanics, crazy formulas and all that stuff, but it, it doesn't have to be so difficult it's really just talking about what you see when you look up outside right now and it's just us learning and the coolest thing about astronomy is we actually don't know a lot we're still trying to figure out so much and you could be the answer to it you know so it, <laughs> you could <laughs> and it's yeah i mean like it's okay it's okay to not know the answer and i think that's what i love about astronomy is even the person who knows everything still doesn't know yeah. oh, some things. Yeah. Yeah. If you weren't uh, an astronomer or if you weren't a planetarium director, like what would you be? Oh man. I don't know. I have, I'm so interested in so many things. I feel like my life could have gone in so, <laughs> so many directions. Like I really love volcanoes and rocks and minerals. And so I could have done something with that. Um, I still love teaching anything that involves teaching I will enjoy so okay. be anything like that like you said I could be a drummer in a band who, who knows <laughs> or thought about returning to stage <laughs> I will only write songs about astronomy no it's cool. that would be a really cool <laughs> okay I so did I did used to want to be the next Bill Nye and I, I won't lie and say that I still don't that would be pretty cool okay, that's okay that's I okay. don't know if does that age me, that reference? I don't know if everyone will. Bill <laughs> and I like come back around on I think, friend circle. To... I think so. I think you're right. He, wow. he refuses to leave the public eye and I support yeah. that. I support that too. <laughs> okay, I have a couple more questions. Some of these are maybe a little bit more. Okay, these ones were submitted by some of my friends and colleagues. Yeah. Okay. We had some questions for you. Um, what some, okay, this one was from Aaron. So he says, why, <laughs> everyone, yeah, <laughs> why does everyone say these, some of these old ruins are astronomical devices, like pyramids or monoliths or like some of these monuments? Do you have any insight into like the astronomical functions of some of these? Yeah, so um, I, I mean, I can't speak fully on everything, but one of my favorite, not, not. <laughs> that's another misconception is that because I'm in STEM, I know everything there not is to know. <laughs> Just like, uh, you must know every book ever that was has ever been. Oh, I mean, um, I do. I know that you do. I know that you do. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so a really one of my favorite astronomical ancient sites, it's this place called Chaco Canyon. So mm -hmm. I really encourage you to look that up. It is so cool. But um, a lot of them, it's 
really interesting that even back thousands of years ago, the sky was still doing the same thing. And it's all because the earth has been spinning and orbiting the sun since it was created. So even before telescopes were invented, people could look up at the sky and notice patterns. And then they would actually build their cities and build these monuments to align with the night sky or the sun on certain days. So there are, you know, places where on a specific day of the year or like the first day of spring or something important to their crops or to whatever, um, the sun will be at a specific part of the sky to cast a shadow from this building. So it'll line up exactly with the other end of their city, you know? So and it's, it's just so cool that even before all of the technology we have, we were still able to know that what the sky does and how it changes and how it repeats for year after year. So even just observing, we were able to learn a lot. I feel like what kind of helped me is like how, like it seems to someone like me who's like, doesn't, I, I don't know astronomy or I like don't know the patterns. Like how long would it take people to make those observations? Like it's uh, like the kind of sort of like maybe generational knowledge that would go into being like, well, we saw it happen this time last year and the mm -hmm. time before that and the year, like how long does it take to pick right. up on some of these patterns, especially, I mean, maybe this is a misconception I have. Like, I think it, there seems to be this, like do things in the sky move slowly or quickly? Like, I feel like I have this idea that change happens in the sky very slowly, but maybe that's not true. Well, it depends on what you're referring to. So something like the moon, that changes very quickly. It, it, go, it goes around the earth every month. So that's a pattern you, you, anyone who's watching, you can notice this. If you look out your window every three days, you'll see the moon in a different place in the sky. You have to look at the same time every three days. You'll notice that the moon's somewhere else and it looks different, right? It's going through a different phase. Um, but something like the constellations, so the stars in the sky, that takes a whole year because the earth is going around the sun. So the stars in the background, they'll change more slowly from our perspective. Mm -hmm. And then something like watching a galaxy change, that's way on a huge time scale that not one person could do in their lifetime, but that's why we write stuff down and we record stuff. Mm -hmm. So like you said, generationally, if someone's ancestors were saying, I noticed that this was happening and it was hot in the summertime this the sun was really high and then the next year oh the sun's really high again and then <laughs> the next year the sun's still high but something blocked it out and they notice an eclipse right so there's just by putting those together and then they can start predicting even you don't maybe don't need 10 years worth of data if you have two mm -hmm. and you can start predicting what's going to happen and that's that's what science is that's a simple thing is just looking and wondering mm -hmm. <laughs> okay i have another question for you okay. um do you think that we're alone no no why nope i but i i will always narrow that look at you <laughs> i'm like <laughs> i i will i always preface that though i don't know if preface was the right word but i'll um i always say that there is, I can't say a hundred percent chance, but there's a hundred percent chance that we're not the only life in the universe. That doesn't mean they look like humans or that, or that does not mean life looks like little green men. Mm -hmm. That could mean a single celled organism surviving right. on this other place. But there are so many places <laughs> there's 200 billion stars in our galaxy. And that's just our galaxy, right? Mm -hmm. And we think that pretty much every star has a planet going around it, at least one. And then even in our solar system, there are moons where we found water and we yeah. found carbon, things that build life that at least that we know of. Mm -hmm. So there's so many opportunities for life to exist. It's just after that, it all depends on what happened. Mm -hmm. And then the further, this is my favorite astronomy fact, the farther away you look at something in space, the older it, you're seeing, you're actually looking back in, when you look up at the sky, you're looking back in time. So, <laughs> so when you see the sun, you're seeing the sun as it was eight minutes ago, because it takes light eight minutes to travel 93 million miles. 
Okay, right. So something even farther than that, if we're looking at other stars with other planets around it, we're probably seeing those 100 years ago mm -hmm. as was, because that's how long it took the light to get to us. And then you go farther than that, you're looking at other galaxies and you're looking at something from two and a half million years ago and then farther and farther and older and older. So even if we do find life, will it still be there? Or are we looking too early and we haven't, life hasn't had chance to change? And, you know, there's so many questions with this. Um, I went, I'm sorry, I kind of went <laughs> on no, a rant. No, 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 I'm captivated. <laughs> yeah. Um, and there are actually, there's a scientist called Drake, and it's not the same as a singer, but he, yeah. <laughs> there's, an there's an equation called the Drake equation that basically takes into account all the things. How many stars are there? How many stars will have planets? How many of those planets will have the conditions for life? And so on and so on. To give you the percentage of chance of life out there. And it's not, it's not zero. It's very small, <laughs> but, it's, but not it's not zero. It's not zero. Not zero. Okay. We just haven't found anything yet. Yeah. Like, I mean, the, that's, that makes total sense. I mm -hmm. think that is what, I believe that too. Yeah. It's like life can look like a lot of different things and we might mm -hmm. not even know what life looks like when we see it. Like, who knows? Mm -hmm. What's your sort of like, hmm. This is a question I'm just thinking of off the top of my head. I didn't know. <laughs> what is your, like, what is your sort of, so you do, so you practice astronomy sort of like professionally. Mm -hmm. um, what is your like personal practice or your personal relationship with like the night sky or something? What does that look like? Do you, you know, observe recreationally or is that what observe recreation? <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, I will say that professionally, I more teach and then I do, okay, okay. I'll, I'll research and learn about astronomy topics, but I don't work with a telescope every night. Oh. Um, we don't have an observatory really because over here on the East coast, it's like the worst place to, to try and look at the night sky. And I live right next to New York city. So it's just very bright and cloudy and it's yeah. not the best place for that. Um, but I just on my own I, I do have a telescope and but again it's not the best place to to try and see things but I've looked at planets out my window um I've gone to the park and you know there's there are there are places that I could drive to um for certain events or just you know because and just kind of have a night where you just look around at stuff um I there's a podcast I listen to every month about astronomy things. There's actually a lot of podcasts about many different topics um, that you could, you know, if you're just curious about something, you can just search and there'll probably be a podcast episode. You know, they've talked about what astron what astronauts eat and how they go to the bathroom. And there's a podcast about it because that's an important question. <laughs> um, I, I want to do more. I really want to start doing photography because I think that's really cool. Um, but yeah, for now, it's just kind of like when I walk outside, I just look up. Yeah. Okay. Well, that was, I guess that sort of yeah. tied into my next question, which was like, how can we, maybe if you're new to astronomy or something like that, mm -hmm. and you don't have a telescope or you don't have like anything else, like how can you sort of uh, practice at home or start like observing at home? Yeah. So right there, podcast, just looking up at the sky. Yep. Yeah. So there's um, apps you can download that show you that I, I know there are apps where you can hold your phone up and it kind of shows you what's mm -hmm. around. Um, there's a great podcast called Sky Tours that actually talks you through what you can see um, like in one place looking mm -hmm. outside um, and that comes out every month. Um, you can also just go outside and see what you see. That's what people used to do. You know, what, no, what do you notice that's different? Mm -hmm. Are there different colors? Where do you think a planet is? Um, you can visit the planetarium wherever you are and they'll, they'll tell you what's up right now. What, what can you see? Um, and I'll, uh, I think I'll actually show you this in a, in a little bit, but there's, there's a software you can get on your computer. That's like a little planetarium on your computer. So there's, there's a lot you can do. Um, and like I said, the great thing about the stars is they do the same thing every year. Planets are a little more tricky because they orbit just like we do, but you can, if you find a map, um, a star map, 
it'll always be the same every month of the year, like depending on the month. So every December, you'll see the same stars. Every March, you'll see the same stars. Um, so you can even just print out a star map and see what you can find. Cool. Okay. I think yeah. that's... All right. Well, I have some final questions, but I'm going to yeah. save them for the very end. Do you want to show us some cool stuff? Sure. I'm going to let you take it away because I want to know what the sky looks like. Okay. So I'll start with that. Let me open up. Um, Mm -hmm. So this program, I'm trying to see, I have a couple monitors, so I'm trying to see which window it's going to open up to. Okay. Um, so let me see if I can yay, share. Just let me know if that worked. Yes. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> okay. So this is a software called Stellarium. So if okay. you, and you can find this, this is free. You can download it on your computer. So I'm in New Jersey right now, but I can just go in here and- Los Angeles, Chile. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know there was one. <laughs> um, so here's the sky where you are right now, right? So the sun's about to go down. Yeah. Um, so I'll just fast forward. Ooh. So we're apparently in a farm of yeah, <laughs> where is this farm in Los Angeles? <laughs> doesn't matter, doesn't matter. <laughs> um, so there's um, bright stars that you can can see. So um, let me see, does that work? So it takes away the atmosphere. Um, I'm trying to here. We'll put up the constellations that you can see ah, oh. <laughs> tonight. So my favorite, one of my favorite constellations is Orion because he's so easy to mm -hmm. see. Um, oh, yeah, so Orion, you can see him by three stars in a mm -hmm. row. That's his belt. Um, so some really cool stuff with this one. There's a bright uh, red giant star called Betelgeuse. I know it doesn't look like Betelgeuse, but um, <laughs> I think it's Betel Betelgeuse. Oh, okay. but, yeah, I don't I just say Betelgeuse because yeah. the movie probably. But um, so but it's cool because it actually looks red with your bare eyes. So you can see that red star and then down in his foot, this, there's a blue super giant star called Rigel. Um, and then his belt here, if you actually follow the line it makes, it shows you the brightest star in the night sky, which is Sirius. So which is at, the North Star? No, yeah. No, no. no. So I'll, I'll actually show you how to find the North Star in a minute. Um, okay. But that's a, that's a, a really um, common idea is that the, bright, the North Star is really bright. Um, it's actually not even in like the top 40 bright stars. Oh, it's, yeah, it's not really that bright, but it's important because it shows you where North is. Yeah. Okay. So the brightest nighttime star is Sirius. It'll be really bright. You'll definitely be able to see that. Um, and then kind of cool right now, the belt of Orion almost points you over to Mars. Um, so Mars is pretty much the only planet you can see right now. Um, Uranus is there, but it's too far away for you to see with your bare eyes. So you will need a, you actually need a quite a big telescope to see Uranus, uh -huh. but you, you definitely will be able to see Mars for the next couple of weeks. It'll be up for a little while. Uh -huh. um, and if you're not sure whether you're looking at Mars, there's another bright star here called Aldebaran. If you're not sure which one is which, because they're both kind of red, um, stars twinkle, right? They wrote that whole song, uh, it, right? So stars, write a song about it. <laughs> stars twinkle, planets don't. Okay. So if you actually watch, Mars will be the red dot that's not blinking. Okay. So yeah, so um, that's kind of the sky um, right now. Okay. Um, in the next weeks, you said Mars will be visible. Yeah, Mars will be visible for the next couple weeks, and then it'll disappear for a few months, but then it'll be back um, with some other planets too. Um, so usually up in the winter, right? Like that's when we see Orion. It. Yeah, Orion's always up in the winter. Yep. Yeah. Good job. <laughs> um, so let me now. Let's see. Let's do this one. So I have a, a couple other things. I guess it depends on yeah. um, how much time we have. But I this. Know. This one is, um, once, once it opens, um, I can talk to you a little bit about some of the stuff that's gonna be happening in 2021. So there's a lot of astronomy stuff um, that is happening, but this is just kind of like a quick 
quick overview. So I'll just pause that and then share again. And hopefully that worked. Can you can you see yourself? Harry, I'm so bad. <laughs> so oh wait, I have another funny question. Yeah. Do people fall asleep in the planetarium? Um, it has happened, but um, not as much um, lately because my shows are so fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it it has happened before, right? It gets dark. I understand, and it's if it's dark and warm, it's just so relaxing and nice. Very <laughs> much. I mean, I haven't been in a while. Like, is it similar to IMAX in that it's like uh, you're sort of in like one half of the dome? So our theater used to be an IMAX actually, and it got changed into a planetarium. There's a lot of different kinds. So ours, you can see it's at an angle. Um, yeah. So all of our seats face forward and then the dome um, above uh, goes all the way back overhead. Okay. Um, and then there's also planetariums that are flat. Um, so right. it, is, yeah. it is really like putting a big hat on, yeah. Um, <laughs> so like I said, we can fit about 400 people um in there um it is i'm trying to remember 89 and a half feet across 88 mm -hmm. and a half feet something around there in the 80s um so it's the fifth largest in the world and yeah the biggest one in the western hemisphere so it's really cool and um everything we show we have 10 big projectors that um it's a digital system so i control everything with a computer um and can show like i said lots of different stuff um so i will just go ahead and tell you yeah. some of the cool things that are going to happen this year um so in the beginning of the year um actually i think this is when i can show you um how to find the north star so um right now these are just a few of the constellations that were out the past couple months so um you've got pisces and you have aries the ram um, which might sound familiar to some people because these are a couple of the Zodiac constellations. Um, they're really, um, the cool thing about the Zodiac constellations is there, there are 12 of them and you see different ones throughout the year. They're in the same path that the sun and the moon and the planets take as they travel across our sky. Ooh, so it's, yeah, so it's all in line. So whatever your Zodiac constellation is, that's where the sun was when you were born. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, if you can find either a zodiac constellation, you can kind of know the area where planets will be. Or if you see the moon or the sun or planet, well, probably not the sun because it'll be too bright. But if you see the moon or planets, then you'll know there's also zodiac constellations nearby too. Oh, OK. OK. Yeah. Good um, so this probably not super relevant right now, but Mars was between both of those. And then around now, uh, Mars, you can see it's shifted its position a little bit, right? Because it's going around the sun, just like we do. Um, so um, I think this is gonna show us now how to find it. Um, so Mars is uh, now next to Taurus the bull. So that bright star Aldebaran that I pointed out is part of Taurus's uh, okay. constellation. Oh. I think that's going to be in the other video. So pause on the finding uh, <laughs> <laughs> Mars. Um, but what is happening with this planet? And the, sorry, the reason I'm looking over here is because that's where. No, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this um, in February. So in a couple weeks uh, from when we're filming this, mm -hmm. um, a rover is going to land on Mars. Ooh, so, I didn't know. So there is there are a couple rovers there already. Um, one of only one of them is still working. That rover is called Curiosity. And we're sending a, a new rover. So it launched a couple months ago and it takes about six months to travel to Mars. Um, so in a couple weeks, that rover is uh, gonna land um, and it's gonna land in this very specific area um, called Jezero Crater. And we picked it because if you see where my mouse is, yeah. this almost looks like a river used okay. to be there. And so basically we think that river used to empty into this crater and it was like a lake or a sea. So we're going to land uh, this rover called Perseverance and it's gonna try to figure out if there was water or not. Um, and then along with that, right? We know that life 
all life that we know of needs water. So we're basically trying to figure out, could life have survived on Mars and can we live there in the future? So um, this is Perseverance, the rover that's going to be landing soon. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the kind of cool thing about it before we get to the next thing, there's actually a drill at the end of this arm. So we've never drilled underground on another planet, but Perseverance is going to be the first thing to ever do it. So it's actually going to look underground and it's going to try to find evidence for water um because well, going never drill <laughs> around on another planet before yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's drilling. but uh a lot of people are more excited at the fact that there's also a little helicopter called ingenuity and this is going to be the first uh auto-powered flight on another world so this guy is basically, it has to be able to fly on its own. We'll give them directions, but it's going to fly around. Um, so a lot of cool stuff happening with Mars. Um, there is going to be um, something called an annular eclipse, a solar eclipse that's happening. Um, so this is going to be happening in June. And I believe you should still be able to see it from California. Okay. Um, and this is really early, or at least for us, but it's going to be even earlier for you. <laughs> Or I guess, yeah, I wonder if you'll, I'll get back to you. If someone, if someone asks you this later, I'll get back to you and find out whether this um, is visible in California. And I feel like it should be, but um, might not be. Okay. Um, this is what we're going to see. But yeah, so this is basically what's going to happen. Um, and the reason that we have solar eclipses is all because of the motion of the earth and the moon and the sun. So, um, oh, so great. This is where we'll be. Okay, so me, oh, so you won't be able to see it, but that's okay. You can just, you can know, you can know it exists, um, but I'll get to what you actually no, will, will be able to see. You can know that it's happening. You can yeah. probably find a live stream of, while, while yeah, this is occurring. Um, and it does happen, right? Every, more than, this isn't going to be the only time one of these occurs. Um, even from New Jersey, we're not going to be able to see the true eclipse. Mm -hmm. um, but I will just say the reason these happen, the reason eclipses happen is because the sun, the earth, and the moon all line up exactly. Mm -hmm. um, but to be even more confusing, the moon doesn't go around the earth in an exact circle. So sometimes the moon's a little farther away, sometimes the moon's a little closer. So um, that eclipse, uh, it's called an annular eclipse because the moon is a little bit smaller from our perspective than the sun. So it doesn't completely block it out. Oh, okay. So this is kind of one of those things where I was talking about. It, it can get a little complicated um, and things always change, right? But for the most part, we have this really cool system. Um, other planets don't get eclipses like we do because the moon and the sun, they're at the exact right distance and size ratio that when they line up, the moon basically covers the sun. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're, we're very, yeah, we're the best eclipse <laughs> planet. Number one eclipses. Number one eclipses in the whole solar system. <laughs> um, so I uh, also have to include any time, not even just eclipses, as this is just say sun safety. Anytime you look at the sun, you want to make sure you're taking care of your eyes. So there was an eclipse um, not that long ago, and there will be another one. So there's a couple different ways. There are solar eclipse glasses that you can use, not the same thing as sunglasses. Sunglasses do not have a good enough filter to block out the rays of the sun. The sun is so bright, right? That's why we have daytime because of it. So looking, <laughs> looking at the sun, even for 30 seconds can really damage your eyes. You might not notice it, but it's basically burning your eyes. So you always wanna make sure you either have special sunglasses, right, those solar eclipse glasses, um, or, like the images here, if you have anything with holes in it and you hold it up and you look at the shadow it makes, you'll actually see hundreds of little eclipses. And the, the cracker is my favorite. <laughs> I love the cracker, but it actually makes a bunch of little eclipses. So that's a like kind of a cool way. <laughs> and then you have a snack. <laughs> no one's ever said that. I love it. <laughs> um, and then if uh, so, like we said, so um, unfortunately, you guys won't be able to see 
that eclipse in a, a couple of months, but in a couple of years, there will be a real total solar eclipse happening. So this is 2024. Um, and it's, it's such a huge difference when you get that exactly right lineup that when the moon passes in, in between the sun and the earth, it almost looks um, like it's nighttime. So yeah. this is this is the view that I'm going to have from New Jersey. Okay. And then it's going to take us to um, somewhere and I, I'll show you the map again. So you'll be able to see um, California. But um, so even from us here in New Jersey, we're not going to see still the full eclipse because you do have to be in the exact right spot. Wow. So, so uh, we won't be able to see it. I'll have to travel a little bit and then you guys will have to travel a little bit also. Yeah. Um, but it'll be super worth it um, because, and I haven't seen this yet. I didn't get to see the, the total eclipse um, from wow. last time, but I definitely will this time. So you want to be in this, uh, that middle lane there to see. Uh -huh. Um, so we're going to show you what a total eclipse does. So it actually, the, the moon passes in between the earth and the sun so exactly that it blocks out almost all of the sun's light. You can actually see planets, Jupiter and Venus. You'll be able to see planets during the day, which you normally can't. You can even see some stars and it just looks like it's nighttime, even though it's in the middle of the day, right? So it's definitely if you're able to travel definitely try and if you aren't it's also fine because a lot of people stream these so <laughs> just remember this date in april 8th in 2024 keep that on your calendar because yeah now it we don't get these every year again because it has to line up exactly right so it's just all about timing and just where everything is in its mm -hmm. orbit uh in space so that's just a couple of the things that are going to be happening. Um, <laughs> so many cool things. Yeah. <laughs> eclipses and like sometimes there'll be a total eclipse, but like they'll only be visible in like the southern hemisphere. Or yeah. Something. So. Uh, yeah. Eclipses happen all the time. We and the same thing with lunar eclipses, not every month. Mm -hmm. um, and it, if you can kind of think of it, like if someone has a bunch of hula hoops, and they're hula hooping and the hula hoops are at different angles. Uh -huh. That's kind of what's happening. Like the moon doesn't go around the earth in a flat line and then the earth mm -hmm. going around the sun in a flat line, it's just tilted a little bit. Mm -hmm. So it's only when everything passes right by each other. So uh -huh. some, sometimes the moon will pass a little above the sun and then the next month it's a little closer and then the next month, oh, we get an eclipse, great. Mm -hmm. And then the next month it's below and then below, right? And then when it does line up, it has to be in this part where we can see it from the United States. And that's not always true, but. Actually, I mean, and yeah, because there was one that was visible in the United States, right? Was that like three years ago or something like that? Yeah, it was 2017. Don't quote me on that. I don't, I don't know how you time works anymore. <laughs> there's one coming up and there's one in the recent memory. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, it's just, it's really all about timing, but from making those observations like they did thousands of mm -hmm. years ago right now that we have enough data we can actually predict when it's the next happen. ones will happen like that's how we know that there's going to be one in 2024 because we know how everything's going to move and even our planetarium software i can go into the planetarium and look up what the sky looked like the day you were born and i can look up what what planets you'll be able to see when you're 100 years old it's really oh. cool. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and we're digging into another planet for the first time ever. That is the coolest thing I've heard all week. I don't know what <laughs> taking me out. I'm like, go digging. Real small step for the rover, but a giant leap for oh, digging yeah. everywhere. Giant leap for dig kind. Digging. For, for <laughs> diglets and <laughs> anyway, oh my gosh, we're getting off. <laughs> okay. All right, my final question for you, Krista, is so what uh, practical and or spiritual, emotional, psychological advice do you have for young people who might be interested in working maybe in planetariums or in like science education, let's see. Yeah, so my biggest thing to say is if you enjoy it, go for it. Yeah. find find ask your school if they have a science night or a mm -hmm. science club um 
find a science center nearby. There's astronomy clubs everywhere. Um, see if there's a museum or a planetarium. Go visit. Talk to the people that are there. If, if you're shy, I totally get that. Um, see if they do shows like this and you can submit questions or see if you can volunteer with them for on one day and just see how it feels. Um, we have job shadow programs. So I, I have had students just follow me around for a day and just see what I do. Um, so see if that's something that exists with your school. And if it doesn't, maybe you can be the one who starts it. Um, you know, all my career all started out because someone said, hey, I need someone to help me give shows in this inflatable thing. And I said, that's, that sounds really cool. Sure, I'll do it. Um, and I mean, at, at this point, I've been to Italy and I've taught high school students astronomy in Italy and in Poland. And I've like, I've gotten to all these cool places because I just see what's out there and I apply to things. I just, just do yeah, it. I just, yeah. And you know, our, even if you aren't sure that the topic, something you're interested in, and I'm, I'm not plugging this on purpose. It just happened, came into my head, but read stuff, look up, <laughs> I'm, you know, but just like get books and find out, read, you know, there's so many cool biographies of people who started out in a totally different field and ended up being an astronaut. Um, or just even The Martian was like, that was my, that's my favorite. Um, it's very accurate, but it was also really, it's a really good book and a really awesome movie if you haven't seen it watch movies, <laughs> watch documentary, you know, just do whatever you can. There's so much out there and so many different ways you can involve yourself and yeah. just, yeah, just try it out. It's okay if you don't like it, but it's always worth trying. Yeah, I think that's <laughs> a theme of like, I think that's the spirit of like this series that we're trying to explore is that like, there's lots of like, just try stuff. You don't have to have it figured out. You don't have to have like a 10 year plan when you are 16. Like <laughs> just try a bunch of stuff and like see what is interesting and just like go down like all of the avenues of your interest. You know, you're like, I'm kind of interested in science or in astronomy. Like just go, go pursue that. See where that leads. And maybe it won't lead anywhere or maybe it'll lead to the, to you. Yep. <laughs> yeah <laughs> but that's for and to you you know and to you <laughs> okay <laughs> sorry um, yeah yeah I think that's that's great advice um Krista thank you so 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 very much um do you have anything you want to plug I feel like I'm on a podcast <laughs> what do you want to plug right now <laughs> um if you want to go to our website um our Liberty Science Center Facebook we actually have a bunch of programs, planetarium programs that um, have been recorded. They're on our Facebook. Oh, if you wanna just watch okay. some of our shows um, and once a month, we're still doing live ones on Thursday, the first Thursday. So if you wanna watch me, I'll be doing a show in March. You and you can, California? You, you can watch, people have gone, they've watched from other countries. So okay. you, yeah, so you can actually watch and you can talk with me on there if you wanna ask me questions and things. So yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank I you. Have answered all of my questions. I'm really inspired mm -hmm. to like just go look up more. And just yeah. And you're right. I love your advice that like it can seem complicated. And sometimes I look at the sky and I'm like, how do I find a constellation? What? Like, but just make your own. Yeah, hey, yeah, I like that. They were they were decided on by a group of astronomers because we just wanted a map of the sky. So make your own constellation. What do you see? See what you see up there. Awesome. Yeah. Um, my last question, wait, <laughs> question is, um, what's your zodiac sign? <laughs> I am well. I am a Sagittarius slash the new thirteenth constellation. There's a thirteenth. Yep. So there's a uh, there's a thirteenth zodiac called a Fucus, and I think it's. I, I can't quite remember why um, that got added in there. And I think it's right. because over time, things actually shift a little bit. Oh. And yeah, and um, so that's a, a, it's a complicated question. <laughs> okay, well, I'm a sex. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's why we vibe, you know. Yeah, I just say sex. 
<laughs> that was totally subconscious. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. From one touch, Harry. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Krista from the Liberty Science Center. She's amazing. She knows so much about space, um, but she doesn't know everything because nobody does. And, and that's okay. That's okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And let's go <laughs> the eclipse. Look out, yeah. <laughs> yeah, just look up. Let me know what you find. Okay.